Following the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945 that led to the surrender and collapse of the Japanese Empire, American occupational forces imposed tough restrictions on Japanese media in an effort to de-radicalize the highly nationalist country. Included in these restrictions were limitations on historical dramas, bans on films depicting war or the post-Meiji Japanese forces, and most notably, restrictions on the presentation of the samurai, the deeply rooted warrior class that once ruled the kingdoms of Japan for centuries, and who many believed were the foundation and focal point of Japanese militarism. While these limitations forced Japanese filmmakers to expand their narrative and technical horizons beyond the typical crowd-pleasers audiences had enjoyed for decades, the end of it roughly five years later saw the birth of the golden age of Japanese cinema, initiated by the fantastic crime drama Rashomon, which though set in the past, focuses not on the history or the Japanese character of the time, but the nature of perspective and truth. It is set there in the times of the samurai, but is not a samurai movie. It was, however, an instant classic, an immense success, gaining international critical acclaim. Rashomon is still regarded as the greatest film Japan has ever produced, a film that also launched the career of the country's single greatest filmmaker, Akira Kurosawa. Kurosawa had grown up a film geek, he was born to a wealthy family of Tokyo Samurai in 1910, during the last years of the Meiji Emperor, a time of dramatic modernization for the island nation, ending their feudal culture and embracing Western ideas and technology. Kurosawa reportedly saw his first film at the age of six, his father believing that the new medium of cinema held great potential for education. He quickly developed a taste for the art, not only watching early Japanese movies, but any and everything the West shipped overseas, including westerns by the score. Come 1954, he would release a film that would change the western forever. Seven Samurai is an almost entirely Western film that just happened to be produced entirely in Japan by Japanese artists. Stripped from the film are the previously relied upon cliches of the samurai genre, including nationalism, loyalty to a daimyo, and the glory of combat. Instead, Seven Ronin, that is, Samurai Without Employers, a socially uneasy and suspected group of people in all other aspects of previous Japanese culture, come to the rescue of villagers, who are the victims of marauding bandits. It's a cowboy story, but with samurai. And this did not go unnoticed in Hollywood, as actor Yul Brenner soon began searching for a director to adapt the film to its obvious roots. The resulting Magnificent Seven, which landed in theaters in 1960, was an act of artistic rebellion in the genre. While Brenner's character is the protagonist, he is also far from the white hat good sheriff come to clean up a town in the name of justice. The Seven are all guns for hire, mercenaries, gunfighters, and outlaws, disinterested in upholding societal structures of justice. A group of people who otherwise would be the villains were it not for circumstance. While the film is now a beloved classic, many audiences and critics at the time hated it, precisely because of what it did to the Western, warping it through the lens of Japanese cinema. International viewers, however, loved it, 
possibly seen the unspoken truths it suggested about this all-American genre that American viewers were just not quite ready to see. The horse, however, had already bolted from the corral, and the age of cynical deconstruction of the Western, along with every other presumption about American society, had begun. The emerging counterculture of the 60s and a new generation of filmmakers took it upon themselves to examine the Western's place in the American myth and what that really meant in the modern world. Films like Midnight Cowboy explored the naivety of an audience raised on such morality tales, unable to cope with the real world and prostituted for their innocence, while Easy Rider explored the appeal of the life of the drifting cowpoke modernized with the American highway and the motorbike, but at its core, still the tale of two riders and wide open skies. Unlike these more modern settings, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid took place in the Old West, but it played with the self-awareness and expectations of the new genre, with Paul Newman and Robert Redford's performances being torn apart by critics at the time as too cheesy and comedic expecting the film to be a straightforward Hollywood Western of good versus evil. The score, itself meant to reflect the modern introspection of the tropes and cliches of the genre, was especially attacked by critics as being anachronistic and absurd, thus missing the entire point of the film that Westerns were themselves anachronistic absurdities. Sam Peckinpah's The Wild Bunch offered a look at a Western stripped away of any moral veneer, presenting what was then incredibly graphic violence, while Paint Your Wagon shellacked on a few extra layers of veneer, reducing life in the frontier to a mindless musical best remembered for getting Clint Eastwood to sing. Her heart was made of holidays Her smile was made of dawn all of these films were released in 1969, the end of a turbulent decade that saw national presumptions and questions fail, while also breaking new and fantastic ground for human civilization itself. Also released that year was the last authentically classic Western, John Wayne's True Grit. By then, even the Duke's unwavering man of action had been bent and broken, a haunted figure of regret undertaking one last ride before the life and world leaves him behind. While by no means a self-reflective character, like to the extent of the younger generation, Rooster Cogburn was a far more complex hero than Wayne had ever played before, and quite fittingly would be his most famous performance. Meanwhile, the deconstruction of the Western moved forward outside the studio prestige and independent scene. The original series of Star Trek, driven by the popularity of the space race, sent the pioneer and frontier spirit into the 23rd century, while Jim West thrilled fans of the popular spy genre, notably the films of James Bond and the television show Mission Impossible, with exploits of Reconstruction era, espionage, and intrigue. And Hee Haw brought the backwoods into America's living room, showcasing a variety of Western entertainers separated by tongue-in-cheek skits mocking the audience expectations about America's rural divide, which had only rapidly increased in the post-war years. The years following the gains of the American Civil Rights Movement and the farcical Watergate scandal that led to the collapse of the Nixon administration in 1974 saw the release of the benchmark for Western comedies, never again to be reached by any that came after it with Mel Brooks's Blazing Saddles. I get no kick from champagne Mere alcohol doesn't thrill me at all So tell me why should it be true That I get a bell out of you Some get a kick from cocaine Hold it, hold it What the hell is that shit? 
which challenged the accepted roles and stereotypes of black Americans in the West, including the many black cowboys and lawmen, such as Bass Reeves, that Hollywood's Western myth had almost completely erased from history. It seems then only fitting that the seeds for Western survival into the modern day were also planted by the very man who had inadvertently helped tear it down. In 1964, Italian director Sergio Leone released A Fistful of Dollars, launching Eastwood's career as the new face of the West. Shot in the Spanish countryside and mostly in the Italian language, with English dubs added later, what would become known as spaghetti westerns explored the tropes of the cowboy through a wholly foreign perspective. What's more, the film itself had a wholly foreign source, being an almost direct ripoff of Akira Kurosawa's Yojimbo, produced in 1961. Kurosawa and Toho Productions would later win a lawsuit against Leone over the theft, but A Fistful of Dollars proved to be its own runaway success spawning two sequels over the next two years. For a few dollars more, and my personal favorite, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, featuring Eastwood's iconic anti-hero and model for the new age of the desperado, the man with no name. The Old West was dead. Long live the New West. <laughs>